Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series where we like to make your green thumb or maybe help you make your gardening or your garden more interesting to other visitors. And that's what we're going to do today. But first, my name is Cindy Brown. I am the Collections and Education Manager at Smithsonian Gardens, and it is my privilege to meet with you every week, as well as introduce you to our wonderful speakers. Please remember to put your questions in the chat box. After our presenter finishes uh, with the presentation, I will ask him questions that you have asked me. We will also share information in the chat box about resources that our speaker is going to share with us today. And you'll notice that we do have closed captioning available for you. You just have to click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. I want to let you know, I say this is a weekly webinar series, but we're going to go on a holiday for about a month and a half and join up with you again in January. So. If you miss us, and I hope you do, I would like you to tune into our Let's Talk Gardens video library, where you can see all of our past presenters, including some holiday presentations, in case you need tips on how to make a centerpiece for your holiday table, or create a wreath, or even decorate your tree. So we have all kinds of presentations that are available on our website and you'll be able to click on the button and see. I think we're up to almost 35 presentations now. So Gabe Andre is with us. Andrelli, I'm sorry, I, I'm looking at the name on his box and with uh, uh, the small print, my glasses aren't even good enough to be able to grab that. But Gabe is with us here today from the Georgia Audubon Society and he has lots of good information. I would say that the birds in your garden are like the jewels in your ensemble. They give us beauty, they make our gardens more colorful, and they can be helpful as well. So Gabe, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to us and lead us down the path of birds and trees, or trees and birds. I'll see you at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Cindy. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the invite to come and, and speak for the Let's Talk Gardens um, series with Smithsonian Gardens. Um, I am, yeah, very excited to be presenting on some of my favorite subjects in trees and birds and talk about how they are related and go together. Uh, I am the Habitat Program Manager at Georgia Audubon, and I've been in that role um, for a little over a year now. Um, and my background is in environmental sciences and ecology, uh, and I've worked with birds uh, for some time now. And uh, I really like looking at things from a big picture perspective and, and looking at how we can incorporate ecology into our garden practices in the way that we manage habitat in general in order to support wildlife um, and especially birds. So I, I wanted to start with this photo of a lovely uh, a warbler on this slide and I thought this is a really representative photo of, of some of the unique relationships that birds and trees have together. This is a prothonotary warbler, one of our eastern warblers, um, and it's an absolutely beautiful bird and here you can see it. And it's perched on top of a bald cypress knee, um, which is a tree, you know, native to the, um, the southeast um, United States um, and kind of creeps up the Mississippi. And um, it's, a, it's an amazing tree, uh, but this warbler in particular uh, has a unique relationship with it. It's uh, a telltale tree of the habitat that this bird prefers, especially during breeding season. And uh, this bird is actually a cavity nesting bird, which is pretty uncommon for our North American warblers. There's only a couple species that nest inside cavities, and it will nest inside the cavity of a bald cypress if the opportunity presents itself. So. This bird you can see is also singing, um, and that's an important um, thing that birds do, and they need to do it in order to reproduce, and it's using that bald cypress knee as a perfect spot to uh, project its voice across the swamp. So I wanted to start with that, and um, 
then I wanted to briefly um, introduce um, our organization. Um, give me a second as I change slides here. I'm having difficulty changing this slide. Steve, you might have uh, better luck by pushing the forward and backward arrows on your keyboard. Uh, sometimes the mouse is not as uh, conducive as the keyboard might be. I uh, gave that a try, and it seems to be. Uh, not working. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and reshare okay. really quick. And then I'm sure sounds that good. We can do that. I asked Gabe what the uh, bird was behind him, too. And he let me know that that was also a warbler. So we're going to have warblers all over the place today. Any luck at all? Surprisingly not. Um, hmm. I don't know. Never had this happen before. But, um, I'm going to try one more time okay. and see if we can't get this to. You, you never, we test these things out uh, with our speakers ahead of time and it always works in the test time, but we always seem to have problems when we're um, uh, actually in the presentation. So no problems, Gabe. It happens to many speakers, even speakers that have done this forever. So. Maybe I'm the jinx, I'm not sure. But, and as you notice, we have uh, some beautiful fall foliage for you to enjoy today, because here uh, in the Washington DC area, we have many beautiful trees that are turning colors right now. And it's always a delight to see the birds that are migrating through sitting in our colorful trees. So Gabe, if this doesn't work this time, I can go ahead and share uh, the presentation and then uh, you'll be able to just tell me to move forward. You got it. Excellent. I'm disappearing. I got it. I figured excellent, it out. Excellent. Good. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. But um, yeah, let's, let's get rolling. Um, so to share a little bit about Georgia Audubon, our organization is obviously based out of Georgia, and we focus on building places where birds and people thrive. We focus on that through conservation, education, and community engagement. Uh, we lead field trips all over the state. Um, I'm a part of the conservation department, and I focus on habitat restoration. Um, and, you know, there's so much habitat that um, we can improve and work on and preserve. Um, and so I'm excited to be a part of that and, and be able to do that looking through a bird lens. Um, and so, yeah, definitely invite you to explore and learn more about our organization if you're interested. Um, but now I want to jump um, right to why, why birds and, um, you know, why should we be thinking about birds when we're thinking about our gardens? So unfortunately, birds are declining at um, pretty alarming rates. So here you can see um, some screenshots from some scientific um, findings that have come out over the past couple of years. So on the top left, the decline of North American avifauna is, is a study that came out in 2019 that found that we have lost about 3 billion birds over the past 50 years, and that's a net loss. So overall, our overall bird populations in North America have declined by about 3 billion birds. That's about one in four birds gone since 1970. So that's pretty alarming stuff. And that same year in 2019, uh, National Audubon uh, published their updated climate report and found that two thirds of North American birds are at risk of, at, of extinction from global temperature rise. And these are both really great resources and great papers. And I encourage you to check them out if um, you're interested in learning more. But yeah, this is pretty unfortunate um, news, and this is definitely something that we should be paying attention to. Uh, and so to take a closer look um, at some of these findings, you can look at a couple different bird groups. Um, and these are resources from the 3 billionbirdsorg webpage, which is part of that scientific paper. And uh, you can see across many of our different bird groups, we're seeing declines from our Eastern forest birds that include the wood thrush, 
to migratory birds, which are all across the whole continent. And some of our most exciting and colorful birds that we get to see, you know, maybe for a couple of weeks or for the summer um, in our gardens or green spaces are just passing through. Grassland birds, although grassland birds don't use trees as much as other birds, the trees that are in grasslands can be pretty important for, for those birds. And unfortunately, our grassland birds are really, really um, having a tough time. And lastly, aerial insectivores uh, is another unique group of birds that sometimes we overlook. Um, but, you know, insects are something we can super easily support in our backyard and our gardens. And so that's something that we can do to help those aerial insectivores um, that come through. Many of them are migratory um, and fly over our houses. And often we mistake them for bats. But there's a lot of really unique bird species that fall into that category. And so I want to go into a little more detail on what scientists are finding with the declines of, of birds. So the paper that was published in 2019 in Science had four main results. First of all, there's about 3 billion fewer birds breeding in North America. Um, so overall, a big net loss. Secondly, even some of our common species um, have been found to be declining. Um, and so we're not just losing um, you know, our very unique habitat-specific birds, but some of our most common species are also going under um, some, some declines. Next, the landscapes are losing their ability to support bird populations. And we're gonna go into a lot more detail on that in this presentation. And then lastly, the most encouraging thing out of all this you know, unfortunate news is that there have been some populations of birds that have increased over time, and those can be linked directly to specific conservation efforts. So you can see woodpeckers, raptors, and waterfowl have all increased since the 1970s, and those can uh, pretty much all be linked to specific conservation efforts that humans have made. So there's hope. We can make a difference um, for birds, um, and the way that we can do that, uh, we're going to go into more detail throughout this presentation. So then we can look at what's causing these losses. So what are the biggest factors that, that are pushing these declines? Well, the first one is habitat loss is the biggest overarching decline. So, you know, making sure that we are creating habitat um, and, and preserving it is very important, but habitat degradation is the second leading cause. So we, we're losing habitat and the habitat that we do have left over is degrading in its abundance to support birds and other wildlife. So we, we really need to be taking a look at how we're managing the habitat that we have, whether that's your garden in your backyard or a city park or even a national park. All of these areas where we have habitat, we need to be making sure that we are paying attention to what we're doing and why they're degrading and, and start to make some changes to improve those spaces. So now we're gonna look at things from a bird perspective. Let's look at habitat from a bird perspective. So here's just a general infographic that does a really good job of, of showing how valuable trees are. So trees are unique in that they, throughout their lifetime, go through every single layer of habitat, um, depending on the tree species, of course. Uh, but they have the ability to start all the way in the ground cover as a little seedling and make their way all the way up to the canopy. And so trees create the most structural diversity on a landscape scale um, compared to any other plant. And as you can see from this infographic, that structural diversity is key in supporting um, a diversity of birds. And that's not to say that structural diversity on a smaller scale, like in a grassland, should be overlooked, um, but rather that structural diversity in general is a very valuable and important piece in, in creating habitat that's going to be beneficial for a wide variety of life. Um, so you can see in this infographic, we have a variety of birds that might only spend um, their time in the canopy or above the canopy or in the understory. Um, and trees offer the most variety of options for, for birds to, to use those different niches. Uh, for example, like a brown-headed nuthatch, which is a species that's found in the southeast U.S., spends a lot of time up in the canopy of pines looking for uh, pine seeds and insects. And they really only come down to the mid-story to breed and look for a nest cavity but they need that mid story in order to nest. Um, and so it's really important to uh, think about structural diversity in your garden or your green space. And, um, and trees are often a great way to add structural diversity um, to those spaces. 
So why do bird, birds need trees? Well, it can be a, a pretty obvious in some situations, but there's, I think, a lot more than um, what meets the eye. So first of all, it's a place to sit, but it's a lot more than just a place to sit, and we're going to go into some detail about that shortly. Uh, trees provide shelter and safety for birds uh, and a place to have a home. Many of our birds have their homes in trees. And then trees provide building materials. So a lot of times birds will build their nest or um, decorate their nest with material that is from a tree. Uh, so you can see the great blue heron, a beautiful bird in the bottom of the screen carrying a large stick. Uh, and so that's an important reason to make sure we're not taking all of our sticks away from um, places where parents might be using them to uh, create their nests. Um, and then lastly, food. Food's a big one, and we're going to go into a lot of detail about that. But you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a brown or a white-breasted nuthatch, excuse me. And that bird is one of our birds that's a tree hugger. Um, it loves to hang on the trunks and the limbs of trees and go scoot up and down looking for insects and other stuff to eat. Um, and a great example of, of a bird using trees to find food. So more than a nice place to sit, what does that mean? Well, clearly birds use trees um, and they sit in the trees quite a bit. If you're going out and you're bird watching, you know, oftentimes you're looking up in the trees to find the birds. And it's interesting, actually, the largest order of birds taxonomically are passerines. And passerines are our perching or our songbirds. And they're, be call they're called perching birds because they have three toes in front and one toe and back. And so they've evolved to perch. They have evolved to sit in trees and on other surfaces um, and, and they're perfectly adapted to do that. And like I said, this is the largest order of birds. This is about 60% of all birds, um, which is about 6,500 500 species have sort of evolved um, with this ability to sit and perch in a tree. So there's obviously a lot of reasons why birds are going to be needing trees and have relied on them for quite a long time. So it's a prominent place to display and sing, right? So birds oftentimes perch in trees so that their voice can project and that they can um, get that, that vocalization traveling across a large distance so that they can attract a mate. And so having a tree can do be a really great thing, especially a, a tree that has some open branches, you know, not just a super uh, a tree that's completely covered in thick foliage, but something that has open area for the bird to be seen by other birds and to project its song. Just like that prothonotary warbler in the first slide that was sitting on top of a cypress knee. It was wide in the open and it was able to project its song across the swamp. Next, fun in the sun or shade. So trees provide a great um, gradient for birds to regulate their temperature. If they want to be out in the sun, they can do that. Or if they want to be in the shade of a tree, they can move within a tree to cool down. And uh, this is really important because birds have feathers. And feathers are a very unique attribute of birds. And birds have to maintain their feathers in order to survive. This is something that they dedicate a lot of time to. So if you see a bird picking at its feathers, that's what we call preening. And birds spend a lot of time doing this. And oftentimes, they like to do this out in the sun um, especially if it's after a storm or, you know, if they're molting, all of our birds molt their feathers. They need to be able to um, get in a place where they're comfortable and they can um, safely go ahead and attend to their feathers um, as they grow. Next, a great lookout. So obviously trees are a great place to um, survey the surrounding area, whether that's um, as a predator or as uh, a prey item. So on the bottom there, you see an Eastern Phoebe, which is a beautiful little bird that we find out in the Eastern US. It's um, a flycatcher. So this bird likes to sit out on exposed branches and look for flies and other insects to catch. A lot of times when you're doing garden work, you might see an Eastern Phoebe following you around, hoping you stir up some insects. They might actually sit on the shovel that you're using um, as a perch to survey the area for insects. Um, and then, yeah, as, as prey items, many of our birds get eaten. They like to be up high and in an area where they feel they can survey the area around them and feel safe. And that kind of goes along with high up and hidden. And then on the right side, you see uh, another bird. That's an anhinga, a bird that's found in the southern United States, kind of along the Gulf Coast. And um, 
It's a really unique bird. People call it the snake bird because they're their long neck. And uh, this bird dives into the water and catches fish. But its feathers, unlike a lot of our other like waterfowl species like ducks, its feathers don't do as good of a job at um, uh, propelling and keeping the water outside of their feathers. And so their feathers get quite wet when they're diving and that's purposeful so that they you know, don't have to put as much effort into diving down into the water and chasing fish. But then when they're all soaking wet, they need an open exposed area with a lot of sun where they're safe in order to dry off. And so you'll see this with anhingas and also cormorants is another type of bird that will do this. But having that um, open exposed tree can be really valuable for them in that regard. So next is shelter and safety. We, we started to get on into this um, with the previous slide, uh, but the first thing is resting and sleeping. Trees provide a great place for birds to um, get their sleep, right? Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a young fledgling barred owl that is using that dead snag as a place to sleep. Um, you know, it can blend in pretty well to that, to that branch but it also gets it high up off the ground away from immediate predators. Um, and with smaller songbirds, uh, a lot of times they'll sleep in branches that are kind of, you know, very lightweight and on the edge of the tree so that if a predator is coming, um, you know, they can feel the branch shaking and are able to get away before um, a predator gets to it. So it provides them a place to get some energy and recuperate um, and get their bodies going. Cause a lot of these small birds require a lot of food have high metabolism, so they really value their sleep whenever they can get it. Next is a place to eat in peace. So a lot of birds, um, you know, are out and about maintaining that, my, that high metabolism. When they find food, um, they want to be able to eat it without getting bothered by other animals. So a tree might provide a place for them to hide and eat it. Also, a lot of birds of prey that are eating, you know, um, meat will take up uh, an animal up into the tree and start eating it so that they don't have to necessarily deal with as many of the ants and other insects that are on the ground. Um, and so those are some ways that birds use a tree as a safe place to, to eat in peace. Next is feeding young. So many of our birds, you know, have their young um, up inside trees and uh, it provides a safe place for them to go ahead and find their young and, and um, basically nurture them until they are uh, big enough to fledge and, and get out of the nest. Next is escaping predators in bad weather. We talked a little bit about escaping predators um, as some of the birds are prey items in the last slide, but bad weather is actually a really big one, um, especially late winter, you know, when temperatures are getting uh, really cold and, um, and you know, you get some late winter storms um, or even like down here in the Southeast where we get hurricane weather. Um, birds need trees in order to um, not get you know, killed in these storms. Uh, and so trees provide a gradient, like I said earlier, of places to hide, um, whether that's to keep dry or just um, get out of the wind. And so those are really important factors as well. And also a reason to have some evergreen um, vegetation in your garden or green space, or at least in the nearby area so that birds have those options. And lastly, uh, mating, a safe place to uh, mate. Um, a lot of birds will mate on the wing flying, but um, some of them need a perch. And so this provides them the opportunity to do so. All right, so who doesn't like a good tree house, right? Many, many, many of our birds um, will nest in trees. And there are a variety of nest types as well. Um, so on the far left, we have a tree swallow in a cavity nest. And about almost 20% of birds worldwide um, are cavity nesting birds. So they nest inside dead or dying trees. Um, and that's an important reason to keep trees, um, dead and dying trees in the landscape. Um, and there are many examples of cavity nesting birds, many of our woodpeckers, some of our owls across the, across the country. Um, and something like a tufted titmouse or a Carolina wren or black capped chickadee um, are all, or not a Carolina wren, I'm sorry, a house wren, are all examples of cavity nesting birds. In the center, you can see a cup nest. Um, and many of our birds will build their cup nests in trees, sometimes in, in shrubs or lower vegetation. But uh, the American robin is a great example of that. And you might find the American robin also building its cup nest um, on a platform as well, such as a part of your house or something like that. But 
Um, naturally, they'll build their, their cup nests in trees along with a lot of other bird species. And then on the right, even our largest, some of our largest bird species, um, like the bald eagle, um, trees are a valuable um, uh, place for them to nest and they need very large trees because bald eagles nests can weigh over hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, and so they can get quite large and they'll use those over time. And so having trees that can support those nests is, is really important. Um, and also other birds will use a bald eagle nest like a great horned owl might use it or an osprey. Um, so it's important to have a variety of trees um, and a variety of life cycles of trees too, right? So we don't want just young, healthy trees. We want old and dying trees as well because some birds are really gonna rely on those um, for nesting. All right, so I wanted to include this awesome photo uh, because this is a really unique example of a bird um, using a tree um, to nest. So this is a brown creeper, a bird that can be found across the, the US. And it is a really small songbird. And it's really unique in its sort of behavior. It likes to fly down to the base of a tree and then work its way up um, looking for insects and then fly to the next tree and work its way up. And you can see it has some amazing camouflage. Uh, and this bird is unique in its uh, uh, relationship with trees and, and nesting in particular because it will actually nest um, inside like loose bark on a tree. So maybe a really old white oak or a shag bark hickory. Um, and so, you know, trees of all ages and types are really important to support a variety of bird species and, and their ability to nest successfully in our green spaces. All right, now we're gonna talk about food. And food is a huge one. Birds definitely need trees uh, for food. And we're gonna talk about parts of the tree, right? Because there are many parts of the tree and birds use a lot of those different parts as food, depending on the type of species of bird that we are, are considering. So there's fruit, nuts and seeds, there's nectar, sap, flowers and buds. All these parts of a tree are things that birds will take advantage of um, in order to sustain themselves. So, and fruit in particular, I like to point out because over 70% of bird dispersed fruit ripens in the fall. And this is really important to um, um, note that this is with native um, tree species, right? So this is a, a reason why we should include as many natives as we can, because the natives are in sync with the movement of birds. Um, birds, when, you know, in North America uh, in the fall, they're gonna be migrating south. Well, at least our migratory species are, and they need a lot of food, like I said, to sustain their flight. You know, we're thinking of tiny little couple ounce birds flying over the Gulf. Um, they need a lot of energy. And so any energy that they can get is really important. So having native plants that are ripening at the right time is important, but also our native plants oftentimes have um, better um, uh, contents within their fruit. So that means they're higher in fat content oftentimes. So a tree like a sassafras or a dogwood or a large bush like a Northern spice bush, those are all examples of, of plants that have fruit that is higher in fat and able to sustain birds and their migra migration more than a lot of non-native plants um, that might be fruiting um, at a similar time of year. Uh, so nuts and seeds, I always like to say are better than a feeder. If you're providing your um, birds in your garden or green space with natural sources of nuts and seeds, it's better than a feeder for several reasons. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about cleaning a feeder if you, you know, are you just using the natural sources? And that's you know, where birds oftentimes spread a lot of disease is that feeders if they're not cleaned regularly. So you don't have to worry about doing that. Um, and then that also gives birds um, the opportunity to find their food sources kind of in a natural space that's less exposed. Oftentimes feeders are a little bit more exposed and can, can be a cause for predation. Now this is not to say that feeders are bad because I think feeders are great in, in many situations, especially as like, a place to bring birds to a focal point if you're doing education stuff. Um, but I always like to say, if you're gonna have you know, a backyard, um, you should start with native plants that provide these resources before putting up a feeder. Um, and the, the other thing is, you know, those oftentimes the, the trees are gonna live a lot longer and outlast any type of feeder or the people maintaining the feeder. Um, so that's another, another thought. 
Next is nectar. So a lot of our, our hummingbirds will feed on the nectar of, of trees, of flowering trees, like a tulip poplar in the spring. Um, and there's actually other bird species that will feed on nectar as well. So some of our orioles will actually go and feed on the nectar from flowers too. So that's kind of a unique thing to be on the lookout for. Um, the sap, on the right side of the screen, you can see a, a yellow-bellied sap sucker. And this bird actually is a woodpecker that drills little holes um, into the trees and um, periodically goes back and forth to those sap wells and um, laps up the sap from them. And um, this is uh, something that is usually, it's, it's not typically detrimental to the tree. Um, most trees can survive, you know, with a, a, a sap sucker going and feeding on the tree regularly. So we very seldom see any um, permanent damage being done to the tree um, or long lasting or, or um, uh, damage in that regard. So next is flowers and buds. And yeah, in the spring, flowers and buds, some birds will actually eat them like some finch species, but also the insects that those flowers and buds attract can be um, food for something like the Eastern Phoebe um, that I mentioned earlier. So some of our fly catching birds um, and even something like a ruby throated hummingbird. Hummingbirds actually rely on insects too. A lot of people don't realize that. And so they might go take some nectar from the flower, but they might also catch some of the small pollinators that are flying around the flowers. Um, and that's really important to sustain them and their super high metabolisms. Then on bottom, bottom of the screen, we have a cedar waxwing, which is another beautiful bird um, that will eat uh, lots of fruit. Um, and one, one particular plant that we like to point out with the cedar waxwing is Nandina or heavenly bamboo. It's a non-native invasive plant that actually contains some cyanide and the uh, cedar waxwings eat a lot of fruit in the winter. And if they eat a lot of the uh, heavenly bamboo or nandina, they can actually die. And so we encourage people to clip the berries off of their nandina or remove nandina from their landscape. And the tree that that bird's sitting on, that um, black cherry is a great example of a native tree that provides a great native fruit source for that bird. So next, food, plants supported by trees. So not only are trees providing direct food resources for birds, but they are opening up the opportunity for so many other plants to survive and grow. And um, this is really important because a lot of these, a lot of plants just simply wouldn't do well without the trees that are above them, creating you know, micro habitats and microclimates that allow these other plants to thrive. And a lot of these other plants are important food sources for birds and other wildlife. So here's some vines listed. Um, and I will say that a lot of um, <clears throat> the species I'll be going over might be catered towards the Southeast or the Eastern US. Um, so keep that in mind if you're you know, not from this region, um, but these are just great examples. And there's oftentimes you know, um, a, a species that's similar to one species in a different area because might um, have a, a sim evolved in a similar way. So cross vine is a beautiful um, vine that hummingbirds will actually feed on. Trumpet vine as well. And you can see the picture of trumpet vine on the right side of the screen with that hummingbird feeding on it. Uh, Virginia creeper and poison ivy are actually great. They're very fantastic. A lot of people don't like them in their gardens or green spaces and rip them out, but they are fantastic for birds. And they provide really critical um, food sources for birds whenever they produce their berries. So, you know, these vines need trees in order to um, have a place where they can grow and get enough sunlight uh, to produce their fruit and their flowers. Um, so this is another reason why trees are such a valuable um, aspect to the landscape and really the foundational building blocks. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say with Virginia and creeper and poison ivy, if you have a place in your landscape where you have them and it's, you know, not in a way where, um, especially the poison ivy, not where you're gonna be bumping into it, then leave it in the landscape and observe the many bird species that are going to be coming and feeding on that. There's lots of thrushes that rely on them in the fall when they're migrating um, for, once again, those fat-rich berries um, that, that allow them to help them to migrate. Understory trees such as dogwood, redbud, and sourwood are, are fantastic. If you want some great fall color, sourwood is absolutely amazing if it's found in your region. Um, shrubs such as spicebush, sweet shrub, and buckeye you know, a lot of those like uh, part shade or shaded areas, and it allows them to survive. So they're oftentimes in heavily canopy rich um, habitats. 
And then ground cover, such as the red columbine that's pictured here, an early spring blooming um, flower that is great for hummingbirds. Uh, partridge berry, foam flower, and ferns, and many other species are great examples of, of plants that you know are in our landscape because trees allow them to uh, have the microclimates and habitats that they need to, to grow. All right, so more plant recommendations. Uh, these are some mid-story uh, trees mostly that are, are really great for birds. And I, I wanna point out now that we recommend that people plant for the value of, you know, for, for the best value for birds and for other wildlife, trying to figure out, you know, what your landscape looked like a long time ago and trying to, um, um, you know, reconstruct that as best as possible. So I know in our gardens, we you know, like to collect a lot of different plants and have a great variety, but in some areas it can be really valuable to just have kind of what that forest or that um, space should look like naturally. And sometimes it can be really difficult to figure that out, but there are, are resources to do that, starting by looking at the geology of the area, um, but paying attention to you know, things like if you're on a north facing slope, a south facing slope um, is, is really important for, you know, choosing which native tree that you're going to put into that, that space if you need to. Uh, so pawpaw, great fruit producing plant, red bud, amazing flowers in the spring, fringe tree, absolutely beautiful, dogwood, parsley, hawthorn, devil's walking stick is one of my favorites. Um, I think sometimes it gets, uh, people don't enjoy it because it, it's one of those plants that kind of pops up in disturbed areas, but it has an amazing flower. Um, huge, you know, I think the largest leaves in North America, those multi compound leaves. Um, and then it has that uh, great fruit that it produces um, uh, later in the year that a lot of our birds will use. Uh, elderberry um, is one that sometimes people don't like because it spreads really well, but it's a fantastic plant for the birds. If you can keep it in your landscape, um, it can be a great resource. Red mulberry and downy service berry are both fantastic. If you want to see a scarlet tanager or a summer tanager, um, those are great plants to have in your space. Uh, a lot of other thrushes and things will also use those plants. American persimmon, a great fall one. And, and many of these plants, we can actually eat the fruit from as well. So that adds some awesome value to the garden. Uh, Chickasaw plum or really any prunus um, is really valuable for birds, spice bush. And then American holly has that evergreen um, aspect to it, which is very valuable. All right, so food, insects and other wildlife. So trees are not only providing those immediate resources um, like fruit, nectar, and seeds, and you know, the value of added plants that they're providing habitat for, but they're providing place for insects and other wildlife to um, be found and to use. So many trees are host plants for a variety of caterpillars and birds need caterpillars. 96% of all birds in North America, aside from seabirds, rely on insects to feed their young. So if we don't have insects in our landscape, we're gonna be losing birds. Um, so it's important to plant native trees that can support those insects. Um, so this is a hooded warbler on the left with a caterpillar that it's likely gonna take to its nest to feed its young. And on the right, we have a red-shouldered hawk um, that is, has a little lizard maybe in a knoll that um, it might eat or feed to its young. And so trees are providing habitat for other life um, that our birds are gonna rely on heavily in order to support their full life cycle. <clears throat> so more plant recommendations. Here's some larger trees um, that are fantastic for, for birds. The first four, oaks, cherries, willows, and hickories. Well, even hackberries too. They're fantastic in, in um, being a host for a variety of insects, especially different caterpillars, which birds are going to be relying on quite a bit. Oaks are kind of the, the number one. There's so many different species of oaks, and they provide habitat for so many different um, insects. And so Oaks are a great option, but you know, going down the list, American beech attracts a lot of other wildlife, which birds might be um, feeding on. Sassafras, like I mentioned earlier, has great droops um, that are great in the fall. Tulip poplar, amazing flowers that even hummingbirds will go feed on in the springtime. And tulip poplar, super tall tree that grows quickly, relatively quickly, and provides that structural diversity we were talking about earlier on. Eastern red cedar, you know, evergreen plant that think is extremely valuable for, for wildlife. Black gum, a great one for fall color, um, great habitat. And then maples and pines. Pines, another evergreen 
um, that provides a lot of great food sources and a place for some birds to roost in the winter time. <clears throat> and then on this slide, we have a beautiful um, American kestrel feeding its young in a dead tree there. And once, in the, once again, that's a cavity nesting bird, so relying on that dead tree for a place to raise its young. All right, so insects and other wildlife, it continues beyond the, the insects and wildlife using the tree itself. Um, the trees are, you know, once they die or once they shed their leaves, they're still providing so much habitat and important resources. So leaves are so critical um, for supporting birds and other wildlife, right? So leaving the leaves in your lawn or wherever they fall is the best, you know, case scenario. But if you can't do that, raking them up and reusing them either in your garden beds or something else um, is very, very helpful. A lot of um, insects overwinter in those leaves. And late in this, the winter, you'll see a lot of birds going down to that leaf litter um, because a lot of the fruits and berries are, are pretty much done for. Um, so late winter, birds really need that leaf litter. Um, and we encourage people to, you know, if you can avoid um, mowing up and, and ripping apart the leaf litter, that's usually best case scenario for the insects. Um, but if you have to mow it up um, that's, and, and leave it in that place, that's better than um, taking it completely out of the, that space. But not only insects, but things like that redback salamander on the right side of the screen um, is another thing that can be found in the leaf litter provided by, by trees and a potential food source for things like an eastern screech owl. All right, so we talked about why birds need trees, but why do trees need birds? So there's four main things here, seed dispersal, forest regeneration, protection, and pollination. On the left, you have a beautiful Eastern bluebird with a bunch of um, insects, uh, or a bunch of uh, caterpillars that it took from whatever plant they were on. And on the right, you have a tufted titmouse, um, which is great for forest regeneration and seed dispersal. So seed dispersal and forest regeneration. Um, this is a big one. Uh, birds move around a lot of seeds um, and nuts uh, that allow forests to grow and spread. Um, and so things like the green jay on the left, uh, the red-bellied woodpecker in the center, the American crow on the right, and even the little red-headed woodpecker in the Georgia Audubon logo, those are all birds that actually cache um, acorns and different nuts and seeds. And these birds cache a lot of them in order to have a food source throughout the winter. Um, but they don't remember where all of those seeds and nuts are. And so they actually help in spreading um, seeds and nuts into the environment that allow trees and other plants to grow. And the thing is, oftentimes these birds are picking out the best of the best when it comes to, you know, say an acorn. And so the ones that they're burying and caching away are, are actually more likely to um, uh, germinate than you know a lot of the other ones that are kind of discarded. So they are gardening um, in the forest naturally. And then in the center of the screen we have a wood thrush and wood thrushes and other thrushes and many birds eat a lot of fruit and uh, uh, some fruit can pass through a wood thrush in about 30 minutes and actually the process of going through the bird's digestive system can actually help scarify the uh, seed and in some case increases the likelihood that the seed will germinate. And it's also when they poop it out it has a little extra fertilizer to go with it. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing. Next, protection. Birds are little security guards for trees. They keep the, the insects off of the tree or at least at a healthy enough um, rate where the tree is not going to be harmed too much by the amount of caterpillars, say, on the tree. So a chickadee like this on the right hand side of the screen needs 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to raid, raise one brood of young. Um, so that's a lot of caterpillars, and that's a tiny bird that where it only weighs a couple ounces. So imagine a bird like the yellow-billed cuckoo on the left. It's going to require even more caterpillars than that. Um, and so they're really eating a lot of caterpillars, and that's another reason to have those native trees so that we can be supporting, you know, a full cycle of life. Because if we're not giving our birds the insects they need, then um, they're not going to be able to successfully raise their young. Pollination, I briefly wanted to touch on. Um, I'm not super familiar with um, what trees, bird, uh, the hummingbirds that we have to pollinate, but I do know buckeye um, do get pollinated by hummingbirds. So the painted buckeye, red buckeye, and bottle brush buckeye are all examples. And I'm sure um, there's others, uh, but I couldn't think of any. Um, and here's, you know, beautiful Anna's hummingbird from out west. 
Uh, and you can see a really cool nest that hummingbirds have. And oftentimes they build their nests on exposed tree branches, um, relatively high up, but on a thin place where not too many predators can get to. And they actually use spider webs and lichen to build their nests. So that's kind of, kind of a neat thing. All right, so we have talked about the fact that birds need trees, trees need birds, but we need trees too, um, and we need birds. So what can we be doing to support birds and you know, the trees that we have in our landscapes? <clears throat> so like I've been saying, plant native. Native is just so important. It provides opportunity for the full cycle of life. Um, let it grow. This is something that uh, we often encourage people to do, uh, especially you know, when we're talking about you know, using native plants and, and gardening and, and creating habitat in your yard. Um, a lot of times, you know, native plants can be expensive. Unfortunately, um, native plants are not super popular yet. And um, oftentimes, you know, the nurseries that are growing them, you know, can't just give them away for free. Uh, and so um, if you don't have the ability to go out and purchase a bunch of native plants, let nature do its thing. Let the birds plant your garden for you. Um, take an area of your garden and let it grow. See what comes up. Um, just learn your non-native invasive species so you can remove those and then let it grow and do its thing. And that can be something you can learn from. Observing the natural ecology that's happening in that space uh, can be really beneficial and um, you can learn a lot from it. Protect living and dead trees, super important. We'll go into more detail shortly. Um, focusing on legisl legislation like tree ordinances in your city, supporting you know, um, the protection of trees, educating others, um, reduce your lawn, the lawn is not very ecologically valuable, so adding um, more space and you can re reduce your water use. You can create a wildlife sanctuary. There are many certifications you can get um, that are great. Uh, and then learn more. Uh, educate yourself on, on the different things and continue to learn. And this little inf infographics from 3billionbirds.org, and there are many things in this little graphic that you can do just at your own home. Um, I know Smithsonian um, Migratory Bird uh, Center has an uh, amazing uh, shade grown coffee um, initiative that you can get involved with and learn more about. Keeping your cat indoors is uh, an incredible thing that actually really helps birds and other wildlife. Unfortunately, bird, cats are really good at catching birds. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, a, little, a little bit more about native plants and reducing your lawn. Uh, this provides and supports the most functional and sustainable habitat. So it's really, really valuable. Um, it supports the full circle of life. Um, native plants, you know, are providing those insects that birds need to raise their young. Uh, they often require less care uh, and you don't need to use pesticides. Weaving the leaves, as I mentioned earlier, is so critical. And then learn the non-native invasive plants. This is very important. Um, I'd say it's more important than learning the natives because if you can pick out the non-natives and pull them out, um, then you can start to see and learn about the natives that are coming in. All right, so perhaps my favorite part of this presentation is protect living and dead trees. So uh, a living tree is almost just as valuable as a dead tree um, or vice versa. They're both incredibly important. We need to protect both of them. So whether it's a young, um, you know, white oak that we're planting in a park or an old dead tree that's passed away and been standing. So many of our birds nest in these trees. And so providing a dead snag is critical. If it's near your house and you're afraid of it falling on something, if you can cut portion of it and leave some of it standing, even if it's five or 10 feet, that's going to be valuable and provide habitat. The only reason we need nest boxes is because we've spent so much time taking dead trees out of our landscapes. Um, and dead trees also provide habitat for insects that once again are, are important. And if you do have to cut down the trees, you can take the trees and just leave them in your landscape laying down. So if you have a tree removed, ask for that wood to be cut up and, and use it in your gardens or green spaces. It's going to enrich the soil, provide opportunities for fungi, for different um, microclimates to form. Uh, salamanders and other wildlife will use that space. And as I mentioned, create a wildlife sanctuary. There's many programs across the nation um, that allow you to uh, certify your yard. Um, and so you can do that and educate others while doing so. Um, and it shows neighbors kind of the value of the space that you have created. Next, I'd say, Visit your local green spaces, um, learn from them, uh, be inspired by them and protect them. So as I was saying earlier, trying to um, simulate, you know, your natural green spaces around you in your backyard can be really valuable in, in creating wildlife habitat. Um, and so going to your local parks and 
uh, national parks and, and preserves and observing what you're seeing there plant-wise can be helpful. And then wildlife sanctuary tours. Um, we've done a lot of virtual sanctuary tours at Georgia Audubon over the past two years. Well, I guess we've done two of them, um, but we post the videos online and, and um, they're great to learn about other people's sanctuaries and what they have going on. Um, and there are many opportunities like that. Other resources, um, Audubon's Plants for Birds uh, database is awesome. National Audubon created a database you can put in your zip code and it generates a list of native plants with different birds that they attract and, and can show you um, native nurseries and stuff and all sorts of stuff. It's a great resource. Um, get involved with your Native Plant Society or your Native Plant Conservation Alliance um, to learn more about native plants. iNaturalist and Seek are both apps that you can get on your phone to help you identify not only plants but other things in your green space and they're a lot of fun. Ebird is a fantastic one. If you're you know, more of a, a plant person and you want to learn your birds, ebird.org um, is fantastic. It even has a quiz you can take, um, photo ID quizzes that you can um, customize to wherever you are in the world or whatever time of year, and you can start to learn your birds. Uh, you can also submit checklists of the birds that you see and keep track of those, and it's a, set of, a community science uh, opportunity. So you're submitting that data and scientists can use that to study bird populations over time. And then lastly, volunteer. Volunteer with local organizations um, and get involved so that you can learn more, um, connect with people, and support the, the populations of birds and, and trees in your area. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, now I will pass it to Cindy um, to facilitate any questions that people might have. Gabe, thank you. I feel like I just went for a walk in the woods and met new friends as we went along. And I'll keep my eyes open for some of those birds that you shared with us. And I highly encourage everyone to do that. This is a perfect time of the year as the leaves are falling. You're going to see, be able to see more birds are not going to be camouflaged near, near as well. Uh, we have some barred owls out at the back of my house and I always like to go out and see them in the winter time. So keep on taking walks and keep on visiting. You've answered most of the questions in your presentation. Thank you, you were very thorough uh, with what you uh, gave to us. But one of the questions that I'm interested in too is when you say two thirds of birds are in danger of extinction, is that two thirds of species or two thirds of the total number of birds? It's two thirds of the species in that study is just looking at North American birds. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it would, you know, change drastically across the, the globe. Um, but yeah, that, that was specifically looking at North American birds and that's two thirds of, of species. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the great relationships with between tr trees and birds. Are there any trees that are more important than others that we could include in our gardens if we just have uh, room for one or two trees? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would say no tree is, is more important than any other tree, but if we're looking at it from a wildlife perspective um, and what you know wildlife we can um, support, certainly um, the, the tall trees that we have the oaks, uh, willows, cherries, hickories, hackberries, those are all really great um, host plants. So they're going to provide a lot of caterpillars for birds to feed their young. Um, and so if you have the space for those trees, those are all really great examples, um, depending on what size you know, space you have and, and you know, what soil and all of that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, and I also agree with you, leave up your dead trees or at least take precautions to cut them down. Uh, we have in our pollinator garden, we have a snag. Uh, it was a dead lace bark pine and we took down part of it. It gets more attention than any other tree in that garden because people are not used to seeing dead trees in our gardens. And so they stop and they read. So please promote the use or the keeping dead trees in the wild areas in your in your neighborhood or in your garden itself. I think you'll see a whole new range of uh, birds coming to visit. So, oh, here's a good question. Didn't even think about this. What about squirrels taking up tree resources from birds? We have non-native squirrels 
that I'm not sure what that word is are in the urban area in East Bay, California. Uh, is are there is there great competition between squirrels and other uh, tree mammals uh, and birds? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not familiar with the non-native squirrels that you all might have out there, but I do know um, here in the east with our eastern gray squirrel and our fox squirrel and, and all of that, um, as long as you're providing um, you know, enough habitat, enough opportunities, then there's not uh, a big competition. And you know, maybe you might see in your yard a squirrel take and use a nest box you have or a cavity um, that was previously used by a bird. Um, and I would say just enjoy it and observe it. It's part of the, the full cycle. Um, in the case of maybe a non-native squirrel species that I could see that potentially leading to um, some issues if they're, you know, particularly um, uh, pushy with, with selecting their nest cavities or if they're in an area where there's a specific species of bird that might be vulnerable. Um, in those cases, I would think that um, there might be an opportunity to put up nest boxes in a way that squirrels cannot get to, um, you know, using like baffles or something on, on poles. Um, that would be a good conservation effort or method to um, go about, you know, giving the birds an opportunity to nest without the squirrels. But in large, if we are, yeah, as Cindy mentioned, doing our best to keep dead trees on the landscape, um, we really shouldn't have to worry about squirrels versus birds. And uh, I know down here in the southeast, we get a lot of southern flying squirrels that will use nest boxes. Mm -hmm. Actually, really cool to observe. It's just a really interesting aspect of the environment. And also, a lot of our birds are going to be eating those squirrels, um, mm -hmm. whether it's squirrels or you know an eastern gray squirrel. And so it's it's providing habitat that's going to provide food for other birds. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, question. I'd like to learn more about that particular area. But I think in general, it, it shouldn't be something that you should have to worry about too much. Yeah, I've seen too many hawks grab a squirrel and take it away. Uh, so I think they, the birds might help uh, keep the population in check after all. Uh, one question, you talked about trees with sh uh, providing shelter and all the other different elements to be able to help out birds. What about water? What can we do uh, to, uh, what, what's the need for water for birds? Is there a great need? Tell us more about water and birds. Yeah, um, here in the East in general, uh, water is not a big uh, concern for, for birds. Um, oftentimes they're able to, to find it, um, you know, successfully and get enough to um, live just fine. But you know, in droughts and things like that, providing water resources um, can be really important. And different areas across the U.S., I would think having fresh water sources could be really, really valuable for bird species, especially during migration or during the winter. Um, you know, in the winter, having a fresh water source can be really important. So putting out some warm water um, in the morning or, or just any water that's not frozen um, can be really valuable for birds. Uh, and I would definitely say water is one of the best ways to attract birds to your space, um, especially here in the east where we have so much forest and birds spend so much time way up in the canopy. If you can install a small water feature or have a bird bath with some uh, water that's bubbling, the sound of water, the movement of water attracts a lot of birds and gets, gives you the opportunity to see them up close. Um, and you want to have that in an area where they can get you know, find cover quickly so it's not completely exposed. And moving water also, you know, can help with mosquitoes. You know, mosquitoes don't do as well with moving water sources. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Water is definitely something to think about. Yeah, and I think we should remind our uh, attendees that just like the bird feeders have to be kept clean, so do the water, uh, the, the water uh, sources need to be kept clean because that's the best thing that you can do. Uh, to prevent any type of diseases from from being shared. But I also there's one question and it is all about native perennials and how much should they collect the seed from and how should they how much should they leave the seed? Uh, have you ever done any studies on uh, that? I mean, they save seed to be able to share with others, but uh, I'm thinking as long as you leave some uh, and just take a little. Are you taking talking about like collecting seed for uh, 
Just um, propagation and stuff? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, I am not super familiar with the best management practices for uh, seed collection. I know there's a lot of different groups that, you know, regularly go out and collect seed, whether for conservation purposes or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, I know there's a, a certain um, threshold basically that's usually best practices. And I don't know if it depends on the species, but certainly leaving um, um, seed on the plant um, is going to be beneficial for the birds. Um, and and but yeah, so as long as you're not taking all the seed, leaving the seed head up, obviously through the winter is really good for birds and, and also insects that overwinter in stems and such and those those things. Um, and yeah, using seed can also be really fun and a, a cheap way to, um, you know, add natives to your yard. So you can collect seeds from plants in your yard and spread them out and let them grow naturally and um, experiment with that. Uh, but yeah, as long as you're not taking all the seeds, and I'm sure there's um, people who uh, collect seed on a more regular basis that have a more precise answer to that question. Yep. But thank you. I would I would agree with what you said. Just and leave more than you take. I would I would highly recommend. So it's that time. And Gabe, thank you so much again for a terrific presentation. It was wonderful to learn more about uh, those great visitors that we have in different times. And I highly recommend everyone to go out and look to see who's in your area. Join a bird club. Uh, do the Christmas bird walk to or bird count and just help with, hang out with other birders and you'll learn quite a bit. As I said, we'll see you back in January, but in the meantime, please check out our videos that we are showing or that we have stored on our Let's Talk Gardens video library during the holidays. We wish you all the best. Thanks, Gabe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.